Um, our topic is going to be a run through the new government guidance on responsible contractual behaviour and also an overview of the uh, forthcoming insolvency reforms as set out in the corporate governance and insolvency bill which is currently making its way through uh, parliament. Um, my fellow speaker today is Ian Wayne, senior partner and head of our corporate team. Good morning Ian. Morning Graham, morning everyone. Right. What we thought we would do is um, take questions at the end of each section. There'll be three, as it were, distinct uh, parts. And at the end, I'll ask for questions. By all means, ask them as we go through, but we'll deal with them at the end just so it gives us a bit of better, better control over time. So, right, without further ado, uh, I will begin and uh, tell you about the guidance on responsible contractual behaviour in the performance of contracts impacted by the COVID-19 emergency, a very uh, catchy title. I'll begin, if I may, by setting some of the background, which is uh, probably all too familiar to most of you. But the government has clearly made a very substantial investment in the UK economy uh, and has taken steps to protect it as far as it uh, deems uh, it can to ensure that jobs are protected and that the wheels don't come off the wagon. I've set out on this uh, slide, again, common areas of uh, various schemes, grants and measures that have been put in place, but they obviously run into uh, millions, probably billions of pounds. So the government is keen to uh, look to protect that investment. And we've already seen with the introduction of the Coronavirus Act 2020 uh, measures, for example, landlords uh, of commercial and residential property uh, can't currently, during, as it were, the period of the coronavirus, a set period, uh, seek to evict their tenants. The idea being, again, it gives um, a, a breathing space and an opportunity for uh, tenants to recover. Um, Fairly early on, uh, we also uh, had uh, sort of mentioned from the um, government that it will be bringing in insolvency reforms to, again, add more protection. Mention was made to start with the wrongful trading um, being suspended, and then it went sort of further into more detailed insolvency measures, which are now been made flesh with the corporate governance and insolvency bill. And in the middle of uh, sort of these these developments, the government quietly announced on the 7th of December, um, May, quietly released um, its guidance on responsible contractual behaviour. So, as I've said, all of these measures, really, the government sort of MO is very much keep calm and carry on be responsible and act responsibly. And it's looking to give a breathing space for companies, businesses to assess the position both during and potentially after the COVID-19 period with a view to giving them an opportunity to recover. But the message that sort of comes through as well is really recovery, as I've said, but also if we're in a difficult position, if we're a debtor company, look to renegotiate or even look to restructure. That could be getting smaller, but it could also mean taking advantage of opportunities and economies of scale to get bigger. So turning to the guidance, as I said, it was announced very quietly without a great deal of fanfare. And it begins, key guidance in this note, the guidance in this note is that parties to contracts should act responsibly and fairly, support the response to COVID-19 and protect jobs and the economy. And that's the strap line, as it were, on the opening slide as the title of our talk today. So again, setting out where the government sort of, uh, the, what the government sort of view is, it goes on, acting reasonably and responsibly will result in better long-term outcomes for jobs and our economy. It then states expressly that it's guidance only. It's not intended to override any specific guidance or procurement policy notes issued by the government. It's not intended to override specific support or relief that's available in contracts or through law, custom or practice or from the government in any of its other COVID-19 responses. It goes so far as to even say expressly that um, it doesn't override any other duties or obligations which a party to a contract must comply with. So it's not a joker, it's not a get out of jail card. You're still effectively bound 
by the contract that you've entered into and its contractual terms. And finally, it makes it clear as well that it doesn't override specific contracts, which is to do with risk assessment, for example, contracts of insurance or public health or pandemic um, contracts, contracts that have been put in place because of the coronavirus. So it begs the question really, what is it? Because it's certainly not law. It didn't come in by way of statute as it, it, as it states itself. It's, it's simply guidance. It's basically a plea and a statement of government policy. It's asking you to play nicely. Paragraph 14 defines or tries to sort of set out an example of what responsible and fair behaviour is. It's reasonable and proportionate response to performance issues and enforcing contracts, including dealing with any disputes. It's acting in a spirit of cooperation where you can. It's aiming to achieve practical, just and equitable contractual outcomes having regard to the impact on the other party, the availability of financial resources, the protection of public health and the national interest. So again, sets it out how it would like you to behave. Paragraph 15 gives broad examples of uh, where the government would like you to use responsible and fair behaviour and where it's strongly encouraged. I've set these out on this slide, but broadly, it's every, uh, I think, possible example of where, as a commercial litigator, I would normally expect to find there would be a breach of contract dispute, relief from imperfect performance, extensions of time, alternative performance, force majeure, frustration, damages claims, deposit returns, enforcement, forfeiture, termination, uh, commencing formal dispute resolution, enforcing judgments, uh, issuing proceedings, they're all there. So in other words, the government is asking you to show restraint, act fairly, act responsibly. It goes on to reference alternative dispute resolution. In other words, if you can't play nice and reach an amicable conclusion yourselves and you have to, as it were, enter into a dispute scenario, try and renegotiate, try and mediate if you can, use fast track alternative dispute resolution before the dispute becomes a formal intractable dispute. So in other words, if you have to fight, at least try and fight cleanly and efficiently. The guidance references the insolvency changes, which weren't made flesh then, but have been now with the corporate guidance, uh, governance and insolvency bill. And it also sets out and mentions the government response and government policy. The interesting thing, I think the most interesting thing from the guidance is a section that talks about the government continuing to review behaviours. So we're already being watched and we're going to, uh, it's going to, the government's going to continue to watch us. Now, this has been interpreted by many commentators as being a warning. The government with its guidance is effectively saying, this is what we'd like you to do play nice but this particular sentence this continued to review has been taken as a warning that if parties don't play nicely then there'll be further uh, intervention further legislation further protection given and i'll touch on we'll touch on a little bit more of the protection later on when we're talking about the, the corporate governance bill but broadly um as i say this has almost been seen as the most significant part the government's asking nicely but if you don't play ball, there may be more to come. So in conclusion, uh, legally, it really has no impact. It is, however, early days, and we're yet to see any mention of it by judges uh, or adjudicators, for example, or it being mentioned in any sort of um, sort of more formal court context. We may start to see that. We have had judges say already that COVID-19 is going to change the way they look at things, albeit we're not quite sure whether that's anecdotal or policy. Um, the guidance is like to have more of an impact if you have public sector or government contracts, simply because the government's not going to want to be seen to be saying one thing and then doing another thing. So it's telling everybody else not to fight, then it roundly sues everybody that it has a contract with for breach. So again, that may help you. It's a good negotiating tool. You know, if you want to write a letter saying the government recommends we do this, let's negotiate. It's kind of a good opening sort of gambit that you're trying to be reasonable. And as those of you who have had litigation or experience of litigation before, the court rules encourage negotiation and openness anyway. So this could effectively be seen as a bolt on to that. Not only do the court rules recommend it, but the government recommends it. It's a statement of policy. As I say, it may be a warning. So try your best to be nice and watch this space. And uh, on that front, um, 
we'll now look uh, to any questions before I hand you over to uh, Ian. If the employer is a local government body and they refuse to allow these guidelines, is there any recourse leverage because of the uh, guidance. Um, I don't think there really is currently legally. Um, I think, as I say, it's more possibly a PR exercise that, um, you know, you can certainly refer to these. And again, um, I, I'm not saying that you would go to the press or anything like that, but it's certainly something I think that you could mention in a letter that uh, perhaps what they're doing is flying in the face of uh, what the government wants them to do. And you know, they're, they're flying in the face of uh, the government's investment and the COVID-19 uh, response. Um, right. I think that's the only question uh, that we have on that. I'll just double check. Um, no, that's it. So on that, I will hand you over to Ian. Uh, thank you, Graham. Um, I'm just going to pause and chat away for a minute because I live under the flight path for Wattisham Airfield and uh, our friends at the Army Air Corps have been rather active of late. So I'll just wait for, for a helicopter to go over and I think it pretty much has now. Um, so the insolvency moratorium, um, this is a feature of the corporate governance and insolvency bill and is likely to come into law uh well, it's likely to finish its passage through parliament at the end of this month come into uh, effect at some time uh, next month now um there will be people sitting out there who will have been reading ahead in my first slide and thinking i'm a terrible man uh, for in the midst of all the covid stuff reintroducing the dreaded b word yes the word brexit is on the slide um, and the reason for that is really to explain what the background to the insolvency moratorium is. Uh, the government has announced it as part of its uh, COVID assistance measures. Um, that is, I think, a little disingenuous. Um, its uh, origins come from a 2016 review, which government commenced in the wake of um, a series of high-profile uh, corporate failures, um, a couple of which in particular either involved or caused embarrassment or concern to the government, one being BHS um, and the other being uh, Carillion. Now, it just so happens that about that same time we had a couple of other things going on. Uh, one was Brexit and one was the EU undertaking its own review of EU insolvency procedures. And rather spookily, uh, what's come out of it all is a recommendation that we introduce into our insolvency law, something which is not dissimilar to uh, one of the uh, results of the EU review. And uh, some of you out there uh, will know this. Um, uh, others may be surprised to understand that there is a degree of jurisdictional competitiveness uh, for insolvency law. So I do think this does reflect a little bit that um, uh, if they've got it, uh, we need to have it in the post-Brexit world. And the cynic in me uh, is moved to utter phrases like la plus a change in that respect. So um, uh, the review identified uh, in the current legislation the absence of a quick procedure to give a company shelter to enable some form of restructuring to take place. And the reason for that is that, in essence, companies would tend to go into one of three insolvency procedures, liquidation, administration, or a voluntary arrangement. Um, uh, liquidation, and in most cases, administration are based on assets under the handing over of control to an insolvency practitioner um, who will supervise a sale of assets um, and the proceeds of the, those sales will find their way uh, through the um, uh, cascade of creditors uh, to produce uh, payments to them. Um, the other one, the uh, voluntary arrangement, uh, is more likely to have an ongoing going concern survival uh, for the company itself, but it involves uh, a substantial procedure and it involves um, uh, detailed documentation and most importantly, it involves uh, creditor consent. So um, how does the insolvency moratorium work? Well, it constitutes a period during which, as a general principle, historic creditors 
won't be able to pursue sums owed to them. So um, uh, the uh, phrase is of a payment holiday. So during that payment holiday, you can't sue, you can't statutory demand, uh, and you can't um, uh, commence or pursue any uh, uh, winding up proceedings. Now, it's important to emphasize that it's a holiday. It isn't a release of debt, nor is it a reduction of the debt. So if a company goes into its moratorium owing a million quid, it's going to come out of it owing that million pounds. It, it, it doesn't in any way, shape or form alter the company's financial position in that respect. Now, the initial period is short. It's 20 working days. Uh, that period can be extended relatively easily uh, for a further 20 working days. But any further extension will require the consent of the creditors or the court. And it's an important feature of the moratorium that, in essence, control of the company remains in the hands of its directors. Uh, so which debts effectively uh, can't be pursued? And this is where it gets a bit uh, convoluted, perhaps. Uh, there is a category of pre-moratorium debt, and it is those debts which are interrupted. So what is a pre-moratorium debt? It is a debt either uh, which was due before the moratorium started, let's say because a service or goods were delivered before the moratorium, the invoice was delivered before the moratorium. That's a pre-moratorium debt. Um, equally, if goods or services were delivered before the start of the moratorium, but because of uh, delayed payment terms, the debt was not due until after the moratorium commenced, that is also treated as a pre-moratorium debt. Now, there are certain debts which fall into uh, that pre-moratorium category, which, however, are not bought by the standstill. Uh, one is debts owed to um, funders, essentially. So banks uh, aren't bound by it. And I'll come on to the implications of that in a little while. And then there is another category of debt, for example, wages and redundancy pay, which are not caught. So those will need to be continue to be paid. And indeed, employment uh, tribunal proceedings can continue notwithstanding the moratorium. Um, moratorium debts must be paid. So what's a moratorium debt? A moratorium debt is a debt relate, relating to goods or services which are ordered after the commencement of the uh, moratorium, um, or they're goods and services which may have been ordered before the moratorium, but they are not going to be delivered until after the moratorium commences. And the sense of that is clear. In order to trade through, the company needs to be able to uh, buy goods and services, and it needs orders which were put in place immediately before the moratorium to be delivered to provide it with the stuff to trade with. However, those suppliers must continue to be paid in the ordinary course. The position of landlords is open to some degree of debate because of the draft legislation, but the general received wisdom at the moment would appear to be that uh, uh, rent relating to the pre-moratorium period would not need to be paid, that stands still, but uh, rent relating to the period of occupation during the moratorium uh, must be paid for. Um, secured creditors are uh, unable to enforce their security without the consent of the court. Um, this is quite a big thing for the banks. Um, and one of the issues that potentially arises with the moratorium is that bank debt has to continue to be serviced through the moratorium. And at the moment, there's nothing in the legislation which would prevent a bank from, um, default, from declaring default uh, on, let's say, a term loan and accelerating receipts so that the whole of the amount of the loan becomes payable during the moratorium. That of itself could scupper the prospects of the moratorium. So in essence, although there is no requirement to notify a bank before going into moratorium, it's probably going to be prudent to do so.
Um, now, I said earlier that the company remains largely in the hands of the directors, but there is a, uh, a supervisory uh, regime in place as well. So an essential element of the moratorium is the presence of a monitor. And the monitor will be a licensed insolvency practitioner who has um, uh, three essential roles. Um, the first is that you cannot go into the moratorium unless you have a ins uh, licensed insolvency practitioner who is prepared to act as the monitor. And in doing so, uh, that insolvency pr practitioner is in essence saying that they are of the opinion that the company is likely to achieve rescue as a going concern through the moratorium. Once the moratorium comes into place, um, it's the role of the monitor, for example, to notify known creditors and companies' house. And then there are within the legislation provisions which require the monitor's consent to um, a number of things. One of which, for example, is the giving of security during the moratorium, which would be important if the restructure plan involved taking on uh, new or enhanced bank debt. Um, the third important aspect of the monitor's role is that if during the moratorium the monitor uh, forms the view that the company is unlikely to achieve rescue as a going concern through the moratorium, the monitor has to call it and that effectively will bring the moratorium to an end. Um, uh, and uh, at that point, uh, 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 another insolvency process is likely to follow. It's in keeping with the intended uh, speed and uh, lack of complication in the procedure that company into a moratorium, there's, there's, a, there's a simple process provided there is no winding up petition in place. So it's an out of court procedure involving the filing of documents uh, rather than a court hearing, uh, which will uh, commence the moratorium. If there is a winding up petition, then a court process would have to be gone through and an order of the court sought to put the moratorium in place. So what are the likely outcomes? Well, if it succeeds, the company sails off into the sunset, um, having survived as a going concern, um, probably with a slightly battered credit rating, but nevertheless, um, it's survived. If it fails, uh, then it is likely to go into uh, another insolvency process. And there is a novel piece of legislation here because if uh, within 12 weeks the moratorium the company goes into another insolvency process, um, moratorium creditors, so those are the people who were due to be paid the um, uh, during the moratorium, and uh, non stood still pre moratorium debts and the principal of those will be funders get a super priority so they are no longer treated as unsecured creditors they achieve a status which comes in um, just below the floating charge holder and that uh, effectively is designed to be an incentive uh, to uh, reduce risk so that um, uh, uh, they will continue to trade with the company through the moratorium period. Uh, can creditors challenge the moratorium? Uh, yes, they can. They can go to court and challenge it on the basis that they believe, in essence, it's unfair. But I suspect very few creditors will because, as we know, court processes don't come cheap. In terms of supplying goods and services during the moratorium, um, suppliers are not allowed to alter the terms on which they supply during the moratorium. So you can't change your contract and you can't fail to supply, for example, you can't bring the contract to an end, relying purely on insolvency termination provisions within the contract. You can, however, uh, there's nothing that would appear to prevent acceleration clauses. So the banks would be able to uh, accelerate, for example, a term loan. And if you're negotiating over a new supply, you can impose pro forma terms, for example, you can ask for payment up front or, or payment on delivery, um, even though that isn't your, your usual practice. So how likely is it to be used? Well, uh, it's quick and easy, but it doesn't reduce debt. So a company has got to have a robust business plan, which will enable it not only to service um, the debts which are caught uh, 
um, or stood still by the moratorium, but also to provide the working capital to trade through. And once the protection of the moratorium has fallen away, the company will need to be able to service the debt which has been put on standstill. One of the uh, significant questions uh, that's at large at the moment is just how willing insolvency practitioners will be to take on the role of monitor. And I've spoken to a number of them and they're wary of it. And they're wary of it partly because of the opinion uh, that they're going to be asked to give, partly because they have relatively little control over how the company's run because the uh, essence of it is that the company will be run by directors. So watch this space as to how insolvency practitioners assess risk, which will in turn form um, uh, their willingness or otherwise to, to act. Um, insolvency practitioners will always tell you that there are those amongst uh, their community who are uh, less reputable than others. And there is a degree of uh, concern, I think, that one or two of the uh, uh, third division uh, uh, insolvency practitioners may simply regard it as an additional basis on which to earn a fee before a company goes into liquidation or another insolvency process. If we're less cynical about it, um, what's it going to be applicable to? I can think of, for example, two specific circumstances where it might work. One is where a company needs a bit of time to meet a large piece of work for which it knows it will be paid reasonably quickly but no payment will be forthcoming until that work's finished and it's coming under credit fears for example a winding up petition being brought against it so you can see a moratorium working there to provide shelter from the threat of winding up to enable that work to be concluded and that cash uh, got in uh, the second would be if the company is in the course of a substantial restructuring, um, the bank are happy with the uh, financial restructuring and won't be put off by the moratorium. And you can see that in those circumstances, a moratorium could provide a welcome shelter to enable that refinancing to be delivered um, and the company to survive. Um, that was all that I was going to say. So I'm going to have, again, a look at questions and I can see uh, one. Uh, did you say that pre-moratorium uh, rent need not be paid, but moratorium debt is due, or did I miss the point? Uh, th th there is there is uh, a degree of confusion, uh, as I said, about um, rent. Um, most rent is payable in advance. So you're either going to go into moratorium having paid your rent in advance, um, uh, in which case the issue doesn't arise, or with arrears of rent. Um, the analysis would appear to be that you don't have to pay the arrears um, during the course of the moratorium. They are stood still, but you have to pay the rent for the uh, for occupation of the property during the moratorium period. So if you went into a moratorium um, one month into a quarter's rent period not having paid the rent, the suggestion is that if the moratorium went on for, say, two months, you would have to pay two months' rent um, during the moratorium and the initial month would be stood still. But I have to say that the legislation is not particularly clear on this, and this is a pragmatic view uh, that many have uh, developed. It's supported by the fact that landlords are not, during a moratorium period, able to bring a lease to an end by a peaceable re-entry for non-payment of rent. Now, I'm sorry that that answer isn't entirely definitive, um, but it's the best that we're probably able to, to do at the moment. Um, I can't see any more questions. So, um, Graham, I'm going to pass back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thanks very much indeed. Um, so I'm now going to touch on the uh, litigation angles uh, that uh, are set out under the uh, bill. Um, as you can probably uh ascertained uh, based on uh, what you've heard so far. I think there'll be a lot of litigation around the bill, but today's talk is really more on the proposed measures in the bill. And I stress that currently the bill is not law, so um, everything I'm going to talk about is, is proposed. 
So the bill basically brings in various temporary measures to deal with the coronavirus period, which relate to statutory demands, winding up petitions and wrongful trading. Uh, so I'll cover those off. And also, as the bill has made its way through Parliament uh, and has had various readings, it's gone before the Constitution Committee of the House of Lords, who have made various recommendations. And uh, I touch on those as we go through, just to try and give some uh, you know, sort of indication as to where things may be going. So statutory demands and winding up broadly in a, in a summary sort of statement, no petition for the winding up of a company can be presented on or after the 27th of April 2020 on the ground that the company has failed to satisfy a statutory demand if that statutory demand was served during the period 1st March to 30 June 2020 or one month after the coming into force of the bill, whichever is the latter. So again, we almost have this embargo, this suspension of uh, winding up petitions based on statutory demands served between that period and winding up petitions can't be brought based on those statutory demands after the 27th of April. Um, that suspension, that position under the bill can be challenged if a creditor has reasonable grounds for believing, one, the coronavirus has not had a financial effect on the debtor company, or, or and or the debtor company would have been unable to pay its debts even if coronavirus had not had a financial effect on the debtor company. So in other words, if you as a creditor can show that the company's trading position hasn't been affected by the coronavirus, or for example, you have a long running debt dispute that took place before coronavirus, as it were, uh, hit the newspapers, hit the country, then you may be able to demonstrate that the winding up petition should go ahead. I underlined on the previous slide this reference to financial effect. There's very limited guidance on that currently. Broadly under the guidance to the bill and under the terms of the bill itself, it's, it's broadly defined as the worsening of the debtor's financial position in consequence of or for reasons relating to coronavirus. So very, very, very widely drawn. Um, you know, it, it's unclear as to whether, you know, that equates to small sums of money or large sums of money, but I think broadly it's likely to be uh, given a very low threshold. So again, a creditor may you know, seek to challenge and, and want to push on. But it looks based on that wording as if a debtor, you know, has a pretty good uh, case to basically say, no, I did have a, a small, it did have a small impact on me and therefore I qualify. So you, you can't bring the petition. So again, on that, we're unclear, but um, it's looking like it's going to be uh, sort of interpreted in favour of the, of the debtor. There's been a couple of recent cases which I touch on. Rear company injunction to restrain presentation of a petition. This was a case involving a high tail retailer, uh, sorry, high street retailer, um, and its landlord brought uh, or sought to bring a winding up petition against it for non-payment of rent. The retailer went to the court and effectively said, uh, the bill is coming in. If the bill does come in, this won't get off the ground because of the embargo. I want to rely on the bill and I want you to, as it were, prevent that petition being uh, presented. And uh, the uh, court said, yes, I will grant the relief because it's clear that there is impending uh, legislation that will cover this. It's pointless for us to let it go through, have the petition advertised, have the damage done to the company's reputation, only to find that you know a month or so later, it comes before a court and the court throws it out. So that was interesting in terms of it it, it was effectively making a decision based on impending uh, legislation rather than existing legislation. That case referenced another case, Travel Lodge Hotels versus Prime Aesthetics, which was a case that really slipped under the radar. Um, in that case, basically, exactly a, a similar sort of scenario. The court prevented, granted an injunction, preventing the presentation of a petition based on ministerial statements. So, uh, the Travelodge predates a company and granted an injunction based on ministerial statements. We now have the meat and bones, the flesh of the uh, insolvency bill and the courts even stronger. So again, going back to what I was saying about the guidance, this may be an indication courts are going to uh, deal with these things a little more uh, 
fairly reasonably kindly than they did uh, previously. Um, carrying with statute demands, if the petition is issued, is issued, but it's not caught by the uh, provision. So, for example, the statute demand was issued on the 29th of February, but the winding up petition uh, doesn't come before a court until later on. The bill gives permission for the court to basically sort things out. And as I say, I think looking at the cases I've outlined, you've got a pretty good indication of how those will be worked through. The court is likely to give the benefit of the doubt to the debtor unless there's strong evidence to the contrary. Um, if a winding up order has already been made, interestingly, under the terms of the bill as it's currently drawn, that winding up order is void. So effectively, it's as if it, it looks as if if you had an order made today and the bill kicks in in a month's time, then um, it's likely that the, the, the bill will obviously act, apply retrospectively and that winding up order would be set aside or in some way removed. And it's very hard to actually um, ascertain how uh, that will actually be dealt with in practice. You know, who is going to pay the petitioning creditors' costs? They might have spent £5,000 or more taking the matter through to get that uh, winding up order. Who's going to pay the uh, debtors' costs? Um, what about the liquidators' costs if he's been appointed? You know, will there be compensation payable because of sort of loss of reputation and so on? Very difficult to, to see how that would work. You know, if, if a bank has already suspended uh, a company's accounts and so forth, um, can that just simply be, you know, reinstated? Will creditors want to get back into bed um, with that company? Very un, un, unclear. Um, However, bless them, the good old House of Lords Constitution Committee has made two recommendations. The first is that the government should provide the strongest possible justification for retrospective restrictions on winding up. So um, it's basically uh, putting the government to, to prove to work a bit harder to justify having retrospective provisions. And also it's recommended that the bill should not have retrospective um, power to void winding up orders already made. So going back to that uncertain scenario that I've just mentioned, Mentioned, it's saying that shouldn't take place, but that if it does, there should be some form of compensation or otherwise that that is provided. So, again, watch that space and see uh, where that where that takes us. As Ian has stressed, really in terms of the moratorium, um, I must stress that in terms of this breathing space on winding ups and on, on statute demands applying, we are looking at a temporary measure that has a limited window. Debtor companies need to use the time to basically ascertain their position, to make decisions. You know, are they going to look to move towards the moratorium? Or are they going to look towards rescue or restructuring or something similar? So although it does give this very useful breathing space, um, it is effectively, um, you know, a, a temporary measure. So I think uh, going forward, it's important that uh, directors keep their finger on the pulse. I now come on to wrongful trading. Um, for those of you that uh, aren't familiar with wrongful trading, uh, broadly section 214 of the Insolvency Act states that where a company has gone into insolvent liquidation and where at some time before the commencement of the winding up, a director knew or ought to have concluded that there was no reasonable prospect that the company would avoid going into insolvent liquidation and that director directors did not take every step with a view to minimizing the potential loss to the company's creditors well then in that situation um, the liquidator can as it were seek to make the as it were uh, director personally liable to contribute towards the assets of the company in relation to the winding up the wrongful trading position under the uh, Corporate Governance and Insolvency Bill is that the wrongful trading provisions will be temporarily suspended for a period of three months, again retrospectively beginning on the 1st of March and going through to the 30th of June or one month after the bill comes into force. The bill st states the court will be able to assume that the person is not responsible for any worsening of the financial position of the company or its creditors that occurs during the relevant period in connection with any wrongful trading situation. So again, you have that clear assumption that the court can make. 
there's currently no real clarification or guidance on that assumption other than what I've just read out to you. There's no guidance, for example, on whether it can be rebutted as we have seen that it's planned that, um, you know, that there can be rebuttal in relation to the, the statutory or the statutory demand winding up position. But again, the House of Lords in the Constitutional Committee have again suggested that it should be made rebuttable if it can be shown that the action would have arisen despite the pandemic. So again, watch this space. I think that will be something that's redrawn and we'll come back uh, with the rebuttal included. At this point, I just want to mention other directors' duties. The bill only seeks to suspend for that short period of time wrongful trading. Um, all other duties remain uh, on directors, uh, they're untouched. So all I would say is again, just be vigilant directors please and keep a very close watch on the company and what you're doing because many of the other uh, duties can impact sort of in the absence of wrongful trading and you could still find yourself as it were li personally liable in, in some way, shape or form. Uh, for, for example, um, the usual position in relation to companies is that directors must have first regard to shareholders. But there's case law, common law, uh, BTI versus uh, Sequana, where basically it was stated that if a company is likely or probable, uh, it's probable that it will go into insolvency, then that duty changes and the directors need to have regard to the creditors position so and, and if they don't they're then in breach and that's a breach of sort of their duty to promote the company's success and a breach uh, of their duty to exercise reasonable care and skill which would then um, fall to arguably be misfeasance which would then under the uh, act give a right for a, again a personal liability claim so just be careful just because wrongful trading suspended it doesn't necessarily mean that um, there won't be some other duty that will bite so if you're in any doubt uh, please get in touch or speak to somebody uh, to sort of better ascertain your position. So again, it's a temporary suspension for, to cover the uncertain coronavirus period. Important that directors keep matters under review. I think as well, it's important that at the end of this temporary period, directors do have a better or, or form a, a good idea of where they're going to go because I have a feeling that as soon as the, you know, the, the position changes um, there's going to be a lot of creditors out there who uh, may not necessarily take the reasonable and fair approach and may be looking to kick on be that through um, insolvency proceedings or through uh, you know, liquidators and wrongful trading so don't relax and don't get court. As I've said, this is a continuation really of the breathing space that the government's seeking to give to businesses uh, to, to effectively, um, you know, get over this 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 corona period. Um, it's a space to allow, for example, consideration of the moratorium provisions, whether you want to go down that route or renegotiate or rescue or restructure. But just to mention here, some companies are not caught by the uh, suspension of the wrongful trading uh, rules. For example, banks and other financial institutions, there's other law which, which governs that. So I just simply mention that in passing. So conclusions from, from this, the government's seeking to give a breathing space, act now and take advantage of it. If you're a creditor, be patient, potentially uh, act reasonably, act fairly, act responsibly, but stay alert and have an eye to the end of the measures. And uh, let's watch this space and see what actually happens because the bill isn't yet law. Um, so we may have some redrafts or some amendments which change things. So, right, that's me. That's my conclusions. Thank you very much uh, for uh, listening. And just one last, I suppose, sweep up on questions. Uh, right, I've got uh, three, I think. Um, have the rules relating to what happens to directors if the company trades while they so changed at all? Um, currently, no. As I've outlined, hopefully, wrongful trading will be temporarily suspended. But other areas, fraudulent trading, for example, um, and the other duties which I've outlined, duty to promote the company, to have regard to um, acting fairly and, 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 and responsibly, um, you know, uh, misfeasance, those will still stay in place. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sure, sorry. the question uh, asker has, has, has um, said, said I've covered it. Um, and then last one, can you please go through those debts? 
not covered by the moratorium. So again, Ian, sorry, I think that's probably yeah. one for, for you. Yeah, there are a couple of questions about the moratorium section, Graham, so I'll deal with that one first. Um, so the debts covered by the moratorium um, are, in essence, debts which were either in existence before the moratorium started. So the simplest uh, example of that is you contract to buy, buy goods, the goods are delivered, and the payment obligation has arisen um, under the terms of supply before the moratorium starts. So that debt will be caught by the moratorium. There is a second category where um, if uh, you contract to um, uh, buy goods and the goods are delivered before the moratorium starts, so the other party completes its part of the contract before the moratorium starts, but under its payment terms, uh, the obligation to pay is not due until after the moratorium commences. Because the goods have already been supplied, that debt will be caught by the moratorium. Um, if, on the other hand, uh, you order goods and those goods are not delivered until after the moratorium commences, um, uh, those goods will have to be paid for. Um, so again, if the, it's, it's, it's not a straightforward distinction uh, in many respects, but the simplest way to think of it is if the company needs stuff or it's going to get stuff during the moratorium, then that stuff has to be paid for regardless of when it was ordered. Then there are categories of uh, obligation which comply with that description but are explicitly not caught because of the terms that we expect the Act to have in it. Uh, one of those categories is the bank. One of those categories is uh, wages and salary arising under a contract of employment. One of those categories is redundancy pay and there are a couple of others. Um, it is possible for the monitor to sanction the payment of a debt which has been stood still. But I suspect that that sanction will happen uh, quite rarely. But if you are a supplier caught by a moratorium, it's always worth asking the question. It's always worth making a case uh, for that. Um, and then there is the rather confusing picture of rent where in essence, the view would appear to be that you have to pay for the days which you occupy during the moratorium, but not for a pre-moratorium period. Uh, uh, pre-moratorium rent would be stood still. Hope that helps, um, but I do appreciate um, uh, the difficulty with it. It's um, in preparing this one and looking at the act, it's probably the feature of it which caused me to scratch my head the most. There's a question about monitor's fees. Uh, are they gonna be hourly based or percentage? I suspect they are more going to be hourly or a blend of hourly and uh, uh, fixed fee. Monitors, again, will be wary around it because the payment of the monitor's fees actually becomes part of what the moratorium has to do. So they can't charge fees which are so high that they're going to strangle the rescue. It's also the case that although they achieve a measure of super priority for their fees, their fees come behind people, for example, who have supplied goods in the moratorium. So they they are that those commercial factors will one would hope tend to encourage them to be realistic about fees it's also likely to be the case that a subsequent liquidator or administrator would be able to challenge the monitor's fees if they looked um, substantially out of kilter so hope that's answered uh, both questions um Graham, I think I'll hand back to you as the man who introduced for the, for the formal sign-off. 
Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ian. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for uh, attending today. We appreciate your time. Uh, we appreciate you're probably bombarded with webinars as well. So uh, thank you for choosing this one. Um, by way of sign off, um, we will have feedback forms and we would ask, please, that you complete those and let us have them back. Um, on that note, I will say goodbye to Ian and goodbye to all of you and wish you uh, a great day. I think it's going to be a hot one. Thanks very much.